While Stacy's mom has got it going on, Stacy herself has been missing since 1981. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to the Lore Lodge. On July 17, 1981, Stacy Aris was on a horseback riding and camping trip with her father, George, in Yosemite National Park. The pair had ridden with a group of six other people up to Sunrise High Sierra Camp on the Yosemite High Sierra Trail. In this region during the month of July, I could not find actual weather data, but it did hover around 70 degrees with a low closer to 50, although in certain portions it could get as low as 40 degrees. Stacy herself was approximately 5 foot 5, 120 pounds, with light blonde hair and retainers on both her upper and lower teeth. It was noted by searchers, including her father, that she could appear between the ages of 12 and 16, depending on her outfit and her hairstyle. The group arrived in the Sunrise High Sierra camp around mid-afternoon on Friday, July 17, 1981. The plan was to rest for the night and then continue down the trail the next morning. Now, this camp had nine cabins that slept about 34 people. Sometime after arriving, Stacy invited her father, George, to actually go on a walk down the trail and take some pictures, a nice little scenic nature hike, and unfortunately, George wasn't really feeling up for it, but he did recommend to Stacy that she change out of the flip-flops she was wearing into a pair of hiking boots, something that she obliged to do. Now, Stacy was also wearing an off-white windbreaker, a white blouse or t-shirt, as well as shorts with red and maroon, uh, maroon and white stripes, as well as baby blue pinstripes throughout. She also donned gray hiking boots, a gold anklet, and blue dot earrings. And as far as possessions go, it was noted that she was carrying gum, her Olympus camera, as well as possibly, but not certainly, a pack of cigarettes. Fathering her, uh, fathering her father's advice. Following her father's advice, she did put on the hiking boots and proceeded to make her way towards the trail. Along the way, she ran into a man named Gerald Stort, who oddly enough does not have a certain age. They just say that he's between 70 and 77, depending on the source that you read. Interestingly enough, Gerald's name also isn't mentioned in any of the contemporary reports. I had to go into more recent stuff, including David Politis's work, to find that man's name, and his age remains uncertain. I've seen 70, 72, and 77, although it probably could be anywhere in that range. It doesn't really matter as far as his part of the story goes, but it is odd to me that there's no actual, you know, defined age here, and that his name is not mentioned until reports that came out 20, 30 years later. So, Gerald and Stacy headed off towards one of the lakes in the area. Gerald would follow her for about 20 to 30 minutes before deciding that he was just too tired to continue and sitting down on, along the trail on a log or a rock. Now, of course, there's also a missing piece here because we don't know, based on the reports, which lake Stacy was actually headed to. There's Tanaya Lake, but that's five miles to the northwest. There's also Long Meadow, which is a flooded portion of a river that sits about 900 feet to the southeast of the camp. But the most likely explanation is that she was headed for Sunrise Lakes exactly a mile away, at least the nearest one. Now, if we go by the fact that Gerald said he walked with her for 20 to 30 minutes and didn't quite reach the lake, that means that he probably made it a mile, maybe half a mile. If he walked for 20 to 30 minutes, then he was going very slowly and probably sat down in view of, but not next to the lake. But we know because he didn't reach the lake that it must have been at least half a mile away from the campsite because nobody really walks slower than one mile an hour, even on a trail like that. Even at his age, he probably would have been able to at least make a one mile an hour pace. And the trail itself is actually a mile long. The distance from the camp to the lake as the crow flies is not a mile, it's slightly less. The trail takes a little bit of a windy road and that adds some distance to it. So again, half an hour at one mile an hour would equal about half that mile. After separating from Gerald, Stacy wasn't seen for several hours, and as another group of hikers approached the campsite, Gerald actually asked them, hey, have you seen a girl? She looks like this, her name is Stacy, she's carrying a camera, and none of them had seen her. So when, when he discovered this, it was time to start looking. So everybody got together, they contacted the park authorities, and the staff from the actual Sunrise High Sierra camp did involve themselves in the search. And for the first night, they looked all over the place before the actual National Park Service itself launched their full-fledged search the next day. This search involved up to 100 people from various different search and rescue organizations, usually working in groups of 10 to 20. 
Of those 100 people that were involved, about half of them were volunteers and half of them were paid either search and rescue or National Park Service employees. Uh, regular searchers were paid $4 an hour and rock climbers were paid $10 an hour, according to documents from the actual National Parks report. For the next 11 days, groups would search a five square mile area around the camp that was defined by natural barriers that they determined that a 14 year old likely couldn't cross, such as cliffs, ravines, and deep or wide rivers. So they basically metered out, all right, where could Stacy have gotten to within the time she's been missing that she would not have to climb over anything or swim? Because it didn't really make a ton of sense that she would even be doing that. Now, there were reports that Stacy had been having trouble with her family or was missing her boyfriend or something along those lines, but nothing to the extent that people genuinely believed that she tried to use this as an opportunity to run away. Why wait until they were at the High Sierra camp? Why not take the horse? Why would she be wanting to leave wearing flip-flops? There's just really no evidence that she was trying to run away, trying to disappear. So, she must have gone missing, and the prime... Uh, possibility for this. The the thing that was being looked into the most was an abduction. Now, who would have abducted Stacy? They're not really sure. They were not in a place that was easy to access, and as far as they know, nobody else saw her. The last person to see her was Gerald, but Gerald had met them through the horse riding group on the trail, so it was very unlikely that he planned to abduct Stacy before they got there, and in 1981, nobody had cell phones. They didn't exist yet. So, there's just no real way that he could have communicated with somebody elsewhere that they were going to abduct her. So, Gerald is kind of out as a suspect here. Now, he is the last person to see her, and if they were looking for a murder, perhaps he would be an option. But again, at the same time, a 14-year-old girl, a 5'5 14-year-old girl, probably could overpower a 70 to 77-year-old man unless he was in absolutely peak physical condition. So... It seems unlikely that Gerald himself did anything to her, and it also doesn't even seem like he was suspected at the time. The news reports don't mention him as being a suspect or suspicious, anything like that. What is suspicious is the fact that he's not actually named until decades later. But after establishing this grid to search for her in this five square mile area, they actually did break it up into yard by yard grids. I couldn't get an actual measurement of how big each block was, but it was much like the Tom Messick case where they searched grid mark by grid mark by grid mark until they had covered the entire area and no trace of Stacy was found. Nothing whatsoever. Three helicopters also assisted the search and failed to find anything on their own and there's even a mention of some issues they had with planes and water sampling helicopters flying at low altitudes in the park without any warning. So what that appears to mean is that the, uh, the fire management teams were doing water sampling and had not told the search and rescue teams about it. And so they had some close runs where they almost crashed into one another. Now, does that mean that this could have anything to do with the disappearance? No, but it does show you that the search and rescue teams were not having the best communication with other national park and local services. As well as the helicopters being involved in the search, there was mention of a dog but that dog was a German Shepherd. Now, German Shepherds absolutely can track people, but they're more prone to tracking human beings over specific people. So, whereas a Bloodhound, you can give it somebody's shoe and it will track that specific person, a German Shepherd is more likely to just hone in on any human being. Um, of course, I'm not a dog expert, I'm just repeating what was in the documents according to the owner of the German Shepherd. It was a two-year-old German Shepherd. However, a lot of sources on this topic say that there were bloodhounds, and I could not find a single mention of a bloodhound or anything that would be called a sniffer dog, as is the terminology used in some of these reports. There is no mention of it, so it seems very unlikely to me that bloodhounds were actually used in the search, which does take down a piece of the missing 411 profile for this case. Part of the missing 411 profile is that bloodhounds can't pick up a scent. In this case, they weren't bloodhounds, there was one dog, so why was it reported that there were bloodhounds? Another thing that is heavily emphasized by these articles from the time is that there are no leads. Over and over again, no trace of evidence, no leads, no direction, nothing significant found. Just all sorts of terms that get released in these documents from the National Park Service, 
as you're kind of reading through because they, they have released certain bits of the information about the search on this topic. But there are still things that are, are being kept behind closed doors and locked inside of secret files. Something else that I saw come up repeatedly in the files on this case was exactly how difficult the terrain was to cross. The San Jose search and rescue team, as well as the Mount Mammoth search and rescue team, all of them kind of have these mentions of it was really difficult to get to a lot of these places. A lot of the places they were searching, it wouldn't make sense for Stacy to even go, but they had to cover it just in case, in case maybe she was running away from something. But there wasn't really anywhere that they could think of that was accessible that made sense for her because she just wasn't in a position to be climbing like that. These are people who are professional search and rescue and they could barely get to some of these places. Stacy obviously wasn't there and it just calls into question, you know, exactly what happened. There's no, th this is why there's no good, simple, realistic explanation in this case is that th it was a pretty small area that she could have even gone to and nobody saw her go in and out. And the actual search and rescue people were really struggling to get to a lot of these locations. So that five square mile area shrinks even more in terms of places she feasibly could have been. So what happened? And that's where the issue arises. There's definitely details we don't know. Because after 11 days and $50,000 in uh, search effort money, they called off the search for Stacey Aris. And part of the issue is all of these oddities with the case. For example, uh, most versions involve people finding her lens cap sitting on a rock by the lake, but there's no mention of that in the actual Park Service documents. They do not say anything about that. The newspapers don't say anything about that. The people involved in the search don't say anything about that. It does not show up until the missing 411 books, as far as I can tell. And supporting my belief that there was never a camera lens found is a letter from Park Superintendent uh, Robert, I'm not going to get this right, Robert Binawice, Binawice, Robert Binawice, to Dave McCoy of the Mammoth Mountain Ski Patrol, and he's thanking them for their assistance in the search. However, he mentions very specifically, not a single clue was found. Nothing. A lens cap would be a clue. A shoe would be a clue. A discarded windbreaker would be a clue. Not a single clue found. That means they found nothing. So wherever this lens cap thing came from, it's got to be apocryphal. Which, of course, immediately calls into question Politis' credibility. However, the FOIA requests are there. He made the Freedom of Information Act request. It was denied. It was rejected. So then he appealed his Freedom of Information Act request, and it was rejected again. Now, the initial grounds on which it was rejected were Section 7A. Exemption 7A to the Freedom of Information Act allows law enforcement related things to be withheld from the public. Things that are uh, possibly going to influence active legal investigations or cases, proceedings. So their argument was at first, sorry, this is a, a possible criminal case. We can't release information because it might help whoever did it get away with it. So we, we can't do that for you. And Politis basically said, this is not an open case. Where are the files? Like, I, you can't withhold them. This is not part of a legal proceeding. This is not part of an, a, an investigation. This is not part of law enforcement in any capacity. So why are you denying me access to the files? And what, what the Department of the Interior replied with is possibly the dumbest thing I've ever heard, which is because the information was compiled by law enforcement, it was therefore law enforcement material. Now, if you are considering the National Park Service to be law enforcement, I don't take you seriously as an organization. And also, a lot of the information was not compiled by law enforcement. But because it was all centralized by law enforcement, it's therefore exempt to the Freedom of Information Act. Technically, in a legal sense, technically, they're correct. But it calls into question why they won't hand over the files. Because if there is something in those files that is directly related to legal proceedings, we should know what those legal proceedings are. Was there a serial killer active? Was she kidnapped? 
do they know things that weren't released to the press? Why weren't they released to the press? What information is the Department of the Interior refusing to provide to David Politis, and why are they refusing to provide it? Now, I couldn't find an actual uh, bit of evidence for this because it happened over a phone call, but Politis claims that when he called about the second rejection, he was basically told, you're never getting that list. Uh, the list being missing persons, uh, or sorry, no, I'm mixing up two different things. Um, according to Politis, what happened was he called and said, I don't understand this rejection. I want to know next steps. I want, I want the case files. And the lawyer on the phone for the National Park Service said, you're never getting those case files and hung up on him. Now, again, this is David Politis' claim. It is anecdotal. There is no evidence it happened. But again, there's also no evidence it didn't happen. And based on exactly how difficult the National Park Service was with him about giving him the information and only allowing him to access stuff that was public knowledge, you've got to wonder if they're hiding something. Because what reason is there for them not to hand over that information? Of course, some of you watching this might be thinking, well, Aiden, the federal government refuses to provide information to people all of the time. They hide stuff from us constantly. Why is this weird? It's not weird. It's just also bad. The government should not hide things like this from you. There is no reason for it. I can understand hiding, you know, top secret military operations against enemies we've declared war on, but you can't know what happened to that girl in the national park? Why? What reason? They don't have one. It's just yet another reminder that the federal government is not your friend. The final thing that I found really odd about this entire case is something that I've already mentioned. Gerald Stewart. No mention of who he was, where he came from. I cannot find him on the internet, uh, probably because he most likely passed away shortly after this if he was 77 years old. But also, there's, it's, it's very odd that every single newspaper article refers to him as an elderly gentleman, a 72-year-old man, another old person on the, on the trail with them. There's all of these different references to him that do not include his name, and the ages vary from 70 to 72 to 77. So what happened? Were they all getting this information from a centralized source? If they were, they probably would have had the same age across the board, as well as either a name or a direction not to name him. He could have been anonymous, and then later his identity was revealed. But... If it was a centralized source, then they would have had an age for him. They wouldn't have just said 70 to 77. Also, if you're going to give an age range, usually you say like 70 to 79 or, you know, 71 to 80. Like, you don't, 77 is a weird spot to delineate that, you know? So it's odd that his name's not present. It's odd that his age differs. And I, I mean, at, at what point did that happen? Did each news article writer or editor decide, you know what, I'm going to leave the name out? Or did they ask him his age and he gave them a different answer each time? Did he refuse to tell them his name? And if he refused to tell them his name, did nobody else on the trail know his name? There's just so many different unexplained variables in this story that even for the points where the later reporting differs from the earlier reporting, the contemporary reports, it's not enough to call into question whether or not something weird happened here. What it is enough to do is make you wonder who is hiding what and who didn't do their job correctly. Because somebody either recorded data that didn't make it to the press or somebody's hiding something. And somebody hiding something seems more likely to me than a journalist not including a bit of information that could make the story more juicy, like a name or a correct age. So, what happened? Truth of the matter is... Until the government releases those files, until they accept that Freedom of Information Act request that they are legally allowed to deny but have not produced a good reason for doing so, until we get that, we are likely not going to know what happened to Stacy. And if it was something where she was attacked by wild animals that they had said weren't there, for example, that's one possibility I can think of is that maybe the National Park Service said there weren't mountain lions in the area. And then there were mountain lions, she died as a result, and they covered it up. Or that it gets into more conspiratorial territory with things like feral people or the Wendigo or so on and so forth. Um, you know, the, the many things we talked about, interdimensional shifts. But until we actually know what's in those files, we can't say that there's not a real-world explanation for this. We just have to say it's a mystery, and 
honestly, whoever in the Department of the Interior is covering it up, your mom's a hoe. I'm Aiden Mattis. Thanks for stopping by the Lore Lodge. Kidding. Obviously, it's the end of the episode. We have to do our little pitch. You know, check us out on other platforms. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're on uh, TikTok. Basically, everywhere you can find us, either by searching The Lore Lodge or Aiden Mattis. Of course, our editor here, Aiden Thornbury, is sitting behind the camera. I'm not entirely sure what he's doing. I'm not making eye contact with him at the moment. He's kind of a weird fuzzy blur of whatever my brain is filling into my peripheral vision. So check us out there. If you want to help support us, you can check us out on Patreon. We have $1 tiers that allow you access to everything, but of course you can always donate more if you'd like to. We also have our YouTube memberships and our website, though I will warn you, I do not have time to actually monitor the website right now, so it's kind of funky. But if you want to stay up to date on email campaigns and things like that, feel free to check us out there. You can also shop on Target and support us because we get a percentage of your purchases using the link in the description. And if you would like to buy anything from Gaia Industries, one of our brand partners, they are also in the link in the description. That is biodegradable bamboo-based products and... Honestly, they're, they're pretty damn great. We also are very, very, very excited to be announcing the launch of our signature Lore Lodge Coffee, Mount Pocono Perk, uh, roasted through Tableau Roasting Company, and in partnership with our buddies over at the Stakuyi YouTube channel and the History of Everything podcast, who have their own as well. I believe it's uh, Lewis and Dark Roast, something like that. I can't remember exactly, but go to tableauroastingco.com and you will get uh, all of that or you can check out the link in the description, which again, contains our coffee blend. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Aiden Mattis, and we'll see you on the next one.